Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Feldstein. I am the writer behind eLiterate and the, the organizer behind the Empirical Educator Project. Thank, welcome to the uh, EEP uh, Standard of Proof webinar series uh, in the historic Muppet Theater. Um, this uh, series uh, does two things. Um, first of all, it highlights um, research that shows evidence of student impact. So um, we believe very strongly at eLiterate and at EEP um, that folks should be making decisions, all kinds of decisions. And right now you're faced with even more than usual uh, to, of your share of tough decisions uh, should be driven by evidence when possible. So we'd like to highlight that and make it easier for you to find. Um, and we also like to highlight uh, vendors uh, who are doing the research uh, to prove out uh, that the service or the, or the product or the recommendations that they're making um, actually have some value behind them. So uh, this week we are highlighting some work done by Titan Partners. Um, we're lucky to be joined today by Gates Bryant, who is a partner there, and Nick Java, who's a senior principal uh, we always, in these webinars, also feature um, an academic partner. Research that we highlight always has to have active involvement of academics, and so we're lucky to have Julia Spears, the Associate Vice Provost for Academic Innovation at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, so welcome to everybody. Um, we have a fair bit of data to, to walk through today. Uh, so the first half of the session, we're going to be um, uh, having a presentation. Uh, please do feel free to ask questions in chat as we go and then in the second half hour um, we'll be we'll be having more of a conversation. Uh, so with that I'm going to turn it over to Nick and Gates to get us started. Great well thank you so much Michael and thank you everybody today for for taking a few minutes to join us. We're super excited um, to share with you um, our, our findings um, from uh, Driving Toward a Degree 2020. Um, I'm going to take the first couple of minutes to orient us to this work, uh, and then I'll hand it off to, um, to Nick, uh, who will share some of our really uh, important findings that we're very excited about. Um, and um, Julia is going to give us her perspective um, about um, her work at Pitt, uh, a real life example, so to speak, of some of the uh, findings that we're generating um, in driving toward a degree. Um, so by way of background, driving toward a degree um, is a research and action initiative uh, that was started in 2015. Um, we, we partner uh, with a number of organizations to carry out uh, research on an annual basis. That research covers um, all of the uh, categories and activities related to student supports and student success. Um, and we entertain and undertake this research um, in partnership with um, the academic, uh, the Advising Success Network um, that's located at NASPA uh, and in partnership with NACADA, the Global Community on Academic Advising. Um, Achieving the Dream, and the Reinvention Collaborative. Um, Julia has been a, uh, an informed contributor to our work over the last couple of years, um, in, in part due to her involvement with the Reinvention Collaborative. Um, so we, in Driving Toward a Degree, um, engage in two broad areas of research. One is we track the ongoing evolution of the technology providers that work in student success. Um, we're working to understand the health of those suppliers, the health of the market in aggregate, um, and uh, key uh, innovations and evolutions of the products uh, that these vendors uh, provide. Um, the second half of our work in driving toward a degree uh, it involves really understanding the demand side of the equation, institutional efforts to um, redesign their uh, and improve their student supports infrastructure through uh, the very systematic surveying of uh, academic advisors, um, student affairs professionals, 
and leaders and others around structures, processes, practices, and technologies um, related to student supports. Um, we have been at this, as I mentioned, since 2015. The work is funded uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we'll talk about at the end here where you can access all of these uh, reports. But today we are launching the 2020 version um, of, uh, of the work uh, and making it public for the first time. Um, and uh, it is uh, available for free um, at drivetodegree.org. We'll share all that with you um, at the very end. But across our work, we looked at the various functions of um, the typical institution that touch students in a supportive student services manner. Um, and we, we traveled the student life cycle um, as it relates to the kinds of supports they might need to access, whether that's financial aid, um, career advice, um, academic uh, degree planning and course selection and academic advising. Um, and, and we want to understand the complex system of structures, processes, practices, and technology that all intersect uh, to, to deliver a student um, experience that drives increased uh, retention and ultimately increased completion rates. And so with that background and introduction, I'm going to hand it off to Nick, who's going to spend a few minutes talking to us about uh, the results we've had this year. Thanks, Gates, and thanks, Michael and John, for helping facilitate today's conversation. Um, so I'll put this today in a framework of problem solution, like a true consultant would do. And uh, we'll start first with uh, the problem. And we've been tracking, as Gates said, since 2015, although you see data here since 2017 and over the uh, biannual results or you know, annual results that we're doing from 17, 19 to 20, about this idea of the problem being uh, advisor capacity. And that sort of manifests itself in several ways, which is what is highlighted by the color bars of either limited budget, students not taking advantage of resources, simply too few advisors, or just a lack of coordination across uh, different departments. And so we have advisors, uh, and when we speak to about advisors, these are not only academic advisors, but also anyone really across the campus who advises a student. And we have them rank the different problems and barriers that they're encountering into improving their advising situation. And as you can see here, that has remained consistent over these past three years. And <clears throat> excuse me, and so we center in on this idea of advisor capacity um, being the main problem with which uh, we're trying to address. And then the solution that most institutions are trying to, um, you know, uh, bring, to, bring to bear to address this problem is this idea of integrated student supports or holistic student supports. So on the left, um, you know, is a sort of visual for what student supports traditionally was, which was this cafeteria model. And Nick appears to have frozen. So I will pick him up and talk a little bit about the, are you back, Nick? Uh, I am, sorry if I did. Yes, you froze for a brief moment. You just need to cover the, the vision around holistic student supports. We lost you when you were describing the left-hand side in the cafeteria. Uh, sure, so the left-hand side, I was walking just through a quick example of what the cafeteria model is and sort of how it manifests itself. Student goes in, meets with an advisor, says they want to take 12 credits a semester instead of 15. Well, that clearly has consequences in terms of when they graduate, which has consequences on financial aid, career services. And each of these experiences for a student was isolated and there wasn't much care or coordination across the student experience. So now institutions are trying to put, you know, the student at the center and really talking about their whole experience and understanding that there are, you know, a butterfly effect if you make a decision on any one of these six, six student supports. And so the key here, again, is to have a holistic approach to advising as a whole, um, you know, whether that advising be financial aid, career services, um, academic advising, or any of the remaining three student supports. And I'll turn it over to Julia now just to talk about sort of this, you know, problem solution framework at is, as it exists at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you. So happy to be here. Uh, so when I met 
Nick uh, at actually a reinvention collaborative slash Nakata administrator institute. It's when the University of Pittsburgh was really looking for a solution for how we were going to create more institutional structures around advising. We have some amazing advisors on our campus, but we're also very distributed as I'm imagining many of your campuses are. We do not have a general education core. So when students come into one particular college and they transfer or uh, shift majors, it looks very different on how they actually um, kind of finished their degree progress. So what we were looking to do, and as it aligned with our, what we are calling our plan for Pitt, which is our five-year strategic plan, it started in 2015 and actually is coming to a close this fall, is, uh, and, and part of that plan had academic excellence as one of our priorities. Specifically, we wanted to serve as a leader in personalizing the educational experiences of our undergraduate, graduate, and professional students with particular attention to mentorship, advising, and tailoring the engagement of the goals of the individual students. So, you know, advising was built into our strategic priority. So in 2015, we knew we wanted to do something a little bit more. It took us a little bit of time to figure out the structure by which that more happened. And so what you see in front of you here is in 2017, um, the provost really just said, you know what, this is going to um, be an institutional priority where uh, advising and the way in which we can create structures for communicating best practices across the various units on campus is going to be a priority for us. And so we started to pull together uh, our advising community in a couple of different ways. And what we saw as a solution for us was to invest in some technology. And so this is where um, my intersection with the Titan partners because I'm very interested in the results of their driving toward degree uh, in 2018 uh, when I was learning about just how technologies can really create some, some structural supports um, to increase communication across the advising uh, community. And for us, we invested in uh, one of EAB's um, student success collaborative. We call it our Pathways program. It's been uh, instrumental and in really creating some additional communication mechanisms across our advising community, where a student will come in, they would talk to one advisor, having the notes, features, and functionality, and being able to seamlessly make referrals to students who needed to talk to someone in financial aid, or maybe they had a mental health or wellness, uh, you know, issue that they wanted to create some additional support, uh, we would forward it on to them and then they would get sort of that wrap around uh, as Nick was referring to the holistic supports for the students. So they would feel like we are more coordinated in the care that we are trying to uh, create on our campus. So this is what you see in front of you is just really a way in which we have been uh, incrementally trying to create some structural and institutional supports for advising. Now keep in mind, I mean, there there's, there's best practices that are that are all over the place on our campus. We have just some amazing professionals and colleagues that we work with. But at the provost office, I think that where we lacked was uh, creating an institutional response to how we would support advising. So we created an, a position, uh, the director of advising and mentoring, and she was hired uh, last year. So. We've been in this for one year. Um, and as part of that, we created a landscape analysis to really understand um, within the units what they saw were the biggest issues, resources, and deficits, but then also strengths that we would want to um, kind of highlight at, at the institutional level. And from that have created a whole series of, of things like professional development workshops. We have a mentoring advising summit we pull, draw together. We've also created a networked improvement community to better understand the data and a really giving uh, units, unit specific data on what's happening with their students. And we've created these very specific um, dashboards so that's so that the, those units can consume that information and adjust their practices accordingly. In addition, I think that you know, COVID, COVID-19 has very much um, put the advisor really front and center. Uh, you know, it happened right when all of our students were um, were registering for fall semester. I mean, literally like two weeks before fall registration opened. In addition to when we were trying to, um, you know, get get our 
our incoming class confirmations happening. So the advisors are really the first point of contact for many of our new students and how we support them, the way they, the resources that we're sharing with them and the structures and technologies that we're using to deliver that content is, was really critical. So for me, you know, hearing some of the information about driving toward degree and the way in which, you know, for us, collaboration has been just a key component of helping to, uh, we've not done anything, um, you know, I think that's, that's earth shattering. I think what we've done is, is kind of cleared a path for communication to happen in a very deliberate and intentional way. And, and really, I spent a lot of time just highlighting and sharing some of the work across campus and, and making folks understand that, you know, we recognize you, we see you, uh, we love what you're doing, we want to amplify that impact. Thanks, Julia. And what we tried to do, you know, Pitt's experience is unique, but what we tried to capture in our um, study of the results that we got back from the surveys um, that we sent out to folks um, for driving toward a degree is like, what is collaboration, right? Is this this general theme, but how could we unpack it in a more tactical way? Or, you know, it's an umbrella term, but how could we sort of, you know, how is it implemented at an institution, right? And I think we identified three key ways in which uh, that is uh, the case. One is setting clear lines of responsibility over uh, student supports, strong communication channels existing between those uh, student support stakeholders and those uh, so student supports being integrated. And these are sentiment based questions where we ask folks to agree or disagree uh, with these statements. And as you can see at Pitt, you know, whether it's the NICs or, you know, the personalized education or the pathways, each of these could be mapped to one of these three main buckets and we wanted to be applicable or sort of inclusive of all types of institutions and how these are sort of implemented at any given institution. And so what we determined was that the most collaborative institutions across student supports are the most successful. So just a little bit about the methodology. What we did is we clustered these institutions based on their responses into those institutions that are either here at the bottom least collaborative or most collaborative. And then we compared their collaboration against these three key indicators. As you can see here, those institutions in shades of brown are much more likely to agree with each of these three indicators. They're much more likely to believe that they have clear lines of responsibility, strong communication channels, and that their student supports are integrated. And that is in comparison to those that are least collaborative in shades of gray, which obviously you can see differences uh, in, in those, uh, in those um, shading colors, and then sort of in your intermediate in between in terms of you know, where they stand. And then with this data as our hypothesis in terms of you know, a solution to a problem of holistic student support to this idea of you know, advisor capacity, uh, we then did a test and said, okay, let's look at four year and two year and four year institutions and let's determine based on our hypothesis, if your most collaborative institutions have seen the largest increases in retention rates. And the data here reflects that. And so what we capture, uh, you know, I'll start with the two year institutions on the left hand side. On the x axis is the, you know, least collaborative versus most collaborative, those clusters of different institutions. And the different shades of color, whether dark gray or light gray or blue or brown, represent the uh, retention rate as measured in the academic year 1213 versus as measured five years later in 1718. And what you can see here above each of these two bars is the increase or potential decrease if we go to four year institutions in terms of that retention rate. And the broader point here for two year institutions is that you can see a quite uh, more significant increase in the retention rate for most collaborative institutions over that five year period. For four year institutions, you actually had a decrease for your least collaborative institutions and your intermediate institutions, but an increase uh, for your most collaborative institutions. So again, the data is telling us in a statistically significant way, because we wanted to test the significance of these results to make sure there wasn't noise in the data, that those institutions, whether two or four year, which are most collaborative, have seen the largest increases in retention rates over the past five, uh, over a period of five years. And Nick, there was a question in the chat that I'll just address directly. Um, you know, the operationalizing collaboration takes on many different forms. That's part of the analytical challenge, the research challenge that uh, exists in, in measuring the effectiveness of various approaches um, to, to student supports redesign efforts. Um, 
so what we've uh, attempted to do in this in this study is um, is sort of abstract things just a bit to say, okay, regardless of how you're approaching collaboration, some of them do it through a network improvement community like uh, the one um, Julia was describing. Others uh, do it through a variety of kind of uh, advising or retention teams or student success teams. Um, and uh, there are a variety of different approaches. Um, all of them have varying levels of uh, fidelity as it relates to implementation of those. <coughs> we wanted to try to strip as much of that out of the equation as possible and boil it down to the principles that appear to matter. What we found was that this clear lines of responsibility, um, uh, clear communication, and integrated student supports were sort of the three descriptors that drive the collaboration. And the collaboration in turn drives uh, improved retention rates at 2x the rate of uh, those that were less collaborative. Lots more we could talk about with respect to your question on how do you actually operationalize it. Uh, we talk about it in some detail in, in, in the fuller papers that we've published today. Uh, but hopefully that gives you a sense for at least methodologically how we approach that, uh, that question. Back to you, Nick. Yeah, and I, I would just say too, we were really excited about the results because, you know, we don't know of any other study that sort of captures, you know, that doesn't speak to a given institution in regards to, you know, a particular technology adoption or a particular practice or process adoption, like say, making advising more centralized. And so, you know, in trying to capture this, yes, um, you know, I think it's unique in a way in terms of us unpacking what collaboration is from a process and practice perspective across the national sample of institutions. We do want to take it further. Obviously, we'll continue on with the work, at least for the next two years, if not beyond, and try to unpack, you know, how do you operationalize not just, you know, collaboration into strong communication channels, exa uh, for example, but then how do you unpack even further that strong communication to, to arrive at more uh, reliability and validity in the data. And then, um, you know, not to be uh, left unsaid is this idea of the role of technology. Clearly, you know, processes and practices, the human element matters more. And that was what was most statistically significant or what stood out in the data in terms of its relationship to actual results to the changes in retention rate. But it's not as if technology does not play a role and technology plays this complementary role in helping address this idea of advisor capacity. And we take technology in terms of how it you know, plays a part in student supports in this uh, complementary role, and we break it out into 14 unique product categories, all of which are explained a little bit more and in greater detail in our, in our work, which you can access at Driving Toward Your Degree. But I wanted to highlight three in particular, three product categories um, and three categories that serve a particular function that sort of best serve this, this, in this complementary role. And that first starts with you know, diagnostics here on the left. And you know, these are tools that you know, help determine whether or not a student is at risk. So you can intervene and you can be proactive instead of reactive. And then caseload management is probably most key in terms of facilitating holistic student supports or integrated student supports because it facilitates you know, the communication, coordination, evaluation, and advocacy across all those different stakeholders to make sure that again, no student is overlooked or mismanaged. And then, you know, student engagement is often uh, cited and had been cited in the earlier problem slide in regards to what is a barrier to advising. And this idea of alerts, signals, and notifications, where sometimes, sometimes it's more of a stick, like you need to, you know, be in the class at a certain time, or more of a carrot in, in terms of a behavioral nudges, a nudge is also uh, key. And so again, you know, we, we want to prioritize that processes and practices matter most according to the data that we found, but technology does play a complementary role in not only facilitating uh, holistic student supports, um, which eases you know, some of the idea of a lack of advisor capacity, but technology plays a role there too in, in addressing lack of advisor capacity, even if you don't have an integrated um, you know, set of student supports. And I should then say too, you know, with the pandemic, you know, these technologies are all that more important because it is hard to facilitate an in-person engagement with an advisor. And so if you need something like a caseload management tool to track students who are in many different directions and aren't on campus and alert signals and notifications in particular, you know, they become that much more important in, in this current uh, situation. And then Julia, I just, you know, you mentioned EAB and the Student Success Collaborative. You know, that, that is a popular technology that has many of these functionalities here that I mentioned. 
Are there others on your campus that um, you've used successfully, whether pre or post COVID, you know, that you would be, you know, particularly keen on? And if not the technology itself, just how, um, you know, the challenge of implementing that technology mm -hmm. and coordinating, you know, its implementation and its use, um, you know, across all the different uh, campuses and different um, functions. Sure, and I think particularly given our, the current climate and the current challenges that higher educational institutions are facing, technology is kind of at the core of how we can deliver services and, and support for our students. So it's even more critical that we have some integrated and interoper interoperability among our technologies. So, you know, if, if your campuses are like ours, you, Sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and um, we don't coordinate or integrate some of our systems as much as we want to. And I think that's changing. So um, two years ago, about two and a half years ago, we also invested in some mentoring platforms. And I know that's part of um, the, the driving toward degree. You talk a little bit about some of those, those software and, and technologies, but that's becoming even more relevant in this particular uh, climate because for all of our graduating seniors, what's what's next for them and how do we ensure that we're connecting them with our alumni who can assist with career preparation and and placement and and so that platform we use the back end is um, People Grove, we call it our pit commons. So it's a common area to bring together faculty, staff, students and alumni in a pit specific uh, platform and, and community and really link those, those students with people who we think that can help them with their career aspirations. Uh, we've seen some, some incredible increase in usage uh, just in the last two months of, of additional alumni coming on board because they want to be a support and really help help our students land. I also think, you know, for, for us, just timely, um, we are trying to create a better front door for our students. So we have a lot of different apps, applications, and technologies that students have to use from, you know, their, their, Canvas, you know, we're, we're moving from Blackboard to Canvas. So you have the learning management system, you have the, the Salesforce um, CRMs, we have our PeopleSoft, which houses all of the um, official information, information for students on how to pay their bills and financial aid. And in addition to some of these advising supports, so EAB and our, we use the Navigate app. And so for a lot of students, they're coming on and they don't know where to go for all this. We have to train them. And, and what we're looking at right now to create really a seamless student experience around technology is a front door. So it would all be in one place and we're helping to deliver information to the student um, on why they would use a different, a particular technology for what task. So really breaking it down to what this will do for you and who, who needs that. So the technology for us, I think is a tool it is not the solution. It's a tool that we will use to train our, our advisors, our faculty, and our staff to better support the students. And I think, you know, we can't do it without some of the technologies. There's just no way to scale. So. Thanks, Julia. So I think we want to turn to the Q&A and just wanted to leave on this last slide. Um, you know, we mentioned many a times uh, where you can find, you know, additional information um, an extended sort of uh, look at some of the slides we presented today. Uh, so we went live uh, with a relaunch of Driving Toward a Degree today, which includes the ability to download um, a series of research briefs um, that we're gonna release, release on a bi-weekly basis via email, but make available at least on the website immediately, which just go into greater detail. And then of course would invite any conversation to talk about you know, this research you know, we've done it over many years. It's meant to be longitudinal, which direction it's headed and how you can um, dice the data in many a different ways. Um, you know, we welcome uh, that conversation. And, and in fact, then uh, to turn to the Q&A, the conversation can start now if, if folks had, had questions. And I would just add, Nick, that, um, you know, we at Titan Partners um, serve in an advisory capacity um, to institutions, um, to foundations, to uh, philanthropies, um, and, uh, and to companies in uh, the higher education arena, as well as other markets in education. Um, we are not in the business of recommending particular pieces of technology. Uh, we are more students of how the markets are evolving over time. 
when we help leaders in higher education um, make big decisions in light of how the markets are moving. So just wanted to offer that quick caveat and, and really look forward to any questions, observations, or con uh, comments you might have based on what we've presented today. Michael? Yeah, great. Thanks, guys. Um, folks, do feel free to, uh, I would ask you to ask in the, in the chat, if you don't mind, um, and I'll keep an eye on it. And in the meantime, I have a few questions of my own. Um, if you could, yes, thank you. Just uh, stop sharing uh, so that we can, there we go. All right, so it's hard not to see everything through the lens of COVID right now. And um, we, the study was, was not conducted um, with COVID in mind, it couldn't have been. Uh, so we're in a position of trying to extrapolate um, some of the less some of the lessons that we might learn and hypotheses we might form based on the data that we have. So just um, what I'd like to do, and again, please feel free to ask questions in the in the chat window and we'll we'll follow up. But it, as we're waiting for those to come in, uh, I'd like to walk through the methodology again just a little bit so people have a clear understanding of what it was that you did, what we can and cannot infer from those data, and then ask a few questions about what that might mean going forward in the new environment. So to begin with, uh, Nick, I just want to confirm my understanding of the methodology. So, and, and this is important folks because uh, we, there's a lot of research that's being thrown out on the web right now, and very often it, it's, it's a survey which may or may not be well constructed. And there isn't a lot of uh, research, cross-reference research beyond the survey itself to um, really understand the, with some depth what the answers to the questions might actually mean. So my understanding, Nick, is that you did some research first with some institutions to identify questions that effectively let you get at certain dimensions of a collaboration. You then fielded the survey, and then you analyzed that survey based on IPEDS results, you know, who was getting what kinds of retention outcomes, um, compared to your calibrated survey results. Is, is that accurate? Nick, we're not- Hi, here. Michael, sorry. I, I, I may have, I just missed all of your questions because I got kicked out just as you said, Nick. Um, fortunately, I, oh. fortunately, I got <laughs> most of it, so I can jump in. Yeah, sure. Nick, the good timing on my part today. today. Sorry about that. Yeah. No worries. I, um, so let me let me take it and 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 Nick, uh, you can jump in if I go off track. So um, so Michael, yes, good job. You got it right, basically around the methodology. So the the instrument, the survey instrument itself, um, has been uh, refined and developed over uh, the the three years that we've been doing um, the the primary research side, the survey side of this work since 2017, and uh, individuals. Uh, from from Nakata, from Achieving the Dream, from Reinvention Collaborative, from others, uh, and from institutions um, have been incredibly helpful um, in helping us to design the instrument. Um, it, it, the survey sample is a nationwide sample of uh, uh, administrators, uh, frontline academic advisors, um, other student support professionals, um, uh, across all types of institutions, um, two-year public, four-year publics, uh, four-year privates, um, and uh, non-selective institutions as well as selective institutions. We have the ability to um, take the individual responses um, and associate them with the IPEDS identifier uh, of the institution at which they work. And we use that um, identifier to connect it to outcomes data, retention, completion rates, et cetera. And then we, um, we do a lot of analysis to connect the qualitative answers or the self-reported answers of the survey respondents um, against hard and fast academic outcomes um, or other measures uh, that are available in IPEDS. Um, so 
that's a quick summary on the methodology. Um, and, uh, and, and you're right, uh, this was done prior, uh, the survey was fielded prior to COVID. Um, it's a little uh, sad and scary to think that maybe even some of our respondents, you know, were uh, asymptomatic during the period in which it was in the field. It was like late December, early January, November, December, and January. Is that correct, Nick, or were we late fall? I forget. For the, uh, this version? Yeah. Yeah, we were um, September, October into November for a few extra folks. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, sorry. So it was in the fall, not 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 early winter. Uh, it was when the survey was fielded. Um, and so it was, they were probably not asymptomatic during that period, a little bit before that. Um, but uh, so, so that was the time frame in which the survey was in the field. Um, and we will be launching it again uh, late fall of this year for the 2021 version. So, so big picture, we have a we have a longitudinal survey, right? Five years. Um, it's broad. It's well calibrated against several different measures. Um, because you're using iPads data, um, the trade-off is, on the one hand, to Suzanne's question in chat, you can only track the outcomes that iPads tracks, and you can only track them with the level of fidelity that iPads tracks them. On the other hand. That's a pretty broad data set, right? Um, and it and it lags. That's that's the other thing, right? But but this is the I mean the finding here, which is on the one hand is is not surprising uh, on a gut level, but on the other hand is is pretty surprising to see when you see the numbers and the differences, is, is that a coordinated response really matters. It doesn't matter how many. Uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter. It's not as effective if you've got a bunch of different uh, retention and completion initiatives going on and they're not connected up with each other. Um, so I have a question on, on the difference between the two-year results, which seem to be more, more dramatic than the four-year results. Uh, Gates, do you have any, any insights, any hypotheses about why that might be true? Yeah, only hypotheses at this point, Michael. Um, and and um, you know, Nick, you can jump in here too. But I would just say that um, a few things. One, um, if, uh, and, and maybe Nick, you can show the, the yeah, pull retention rate slide real quick again, the impact slide. Um, in, in the case of the four-year um, sample set that we have, um, our average among um, our respondents um, is is already, um, you know, uh, I would say like quite, you know, quite high. If you look um, at the, the the rates in the in the mid 70s um, on the right hand side of this chart, um, in the 2012 and 13 academic year, that is, um, you know, that's a that's a fairly high, um, you know, sort of rate of of, of retention. Um, uh, among uh, among four-year institutions, um, and so every additional point after the seventy percent range, in particular, gets that much harder to accomplish. Sure. Um, and so two points of gain going from seventy-four to seventy-seven may be um, you know harder to accomplish than the six points of gain we see um, on the on the on the two-year side uh, of things. If if that intuition. Uh, and logic makes makes sense to you, uh, to you, Michael. I think what, one of the other things that we would observe um, is that uh, you know typically um, two-year institutions um, have uh, you know less uh, financial resources uh, and 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 less um, staff uh, associated to academic advising and support, um, and and so there that advising capacity constraint. Is, is higher among two-year institutions. So that when two-year institutions undertake this deep and meaningful collaboration, um, they, they, see, they see bigger bang for the buck, so to speak, in, 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 that, in that collaboration building work. Okay. So, so to, to sum up, um, it's a lot harder, number one, to increase uh, your retention rates when they're already high. There's less low-hanging fruit. There are fewer students who are dropping out in for reasons that you can intervene on and and 
and make a difference on. And number two, uh, there's, uh, there's a lower threat, um, resource rate, uh, match with the, with the need in, in low resource institutions. Um, I, I, Julia, I have two questions for you on this. Uh, first, pre-COVID, Pitt is not an institution that is struggling to keep students in, in graduate, you know, toward getting through to a degree. So, so what were your motivations um, for getting involved with this study then? And I, I know you have Pitt motivations and then you have larger uh, um, affiliations that you can talk about. But also, um, have those motivations changed um, in the COVID era? Mm -hmm. um, I think our motivation to get involved in just sort of looking at our advising practices and as a result of looking at our advising practices became aware of uh, what Gates and Nick are doing in terms of the driving toward degree was hearing from our students. You know, we heard through focus groups and through different um, data collection that, you know, they are advising while I think overall is just fine and we don't have to do anything. The students were reporting that at key transition points, there's a lot of confusion. And for us, when we recognize that there's a way to ensure a much stronger, more streamlined, more efficient advising um, process for our students and we're responding um, to them and to their concerns. And if there's a way for us to increase student engagement and we think student engagement has direct ties to their, um, their connection back to the institution um, and how, the, how connected they are uh, to the institution would then ultimately, um, you know, we'll see that down the road as they become alumni. You know, I think all of it is interconnected, right? And so for us, we, we want to be the very best. You know, we have as a goal of creating this, you know, we want to be a leader in being responsive to our students and how do we ensure that we are helping connect them to our alumni who can help with you know building out their network but then also to a passion that hopefully they find in one of our academic degree programs and that we have the structures for them to thrive in out of classroom and in their academic work so advising is a key part of that because many of those transition points students we were hearing from students that they weren't as smooth as they needed to be so that's sort of what i think what what the why we started why we started this, I think in, you know, given where we are right now and given the investment um, that the University of Pittsburgh has made in some of these platforms and technologies to assist in, in really creating robust structures for those academic and student supports, it's even more important that we figure out what our priorities are because, um, you know, we're not able to have the luxury of, of delivering information in person anymore. I mean, so far I haven't seen a student in months, right? Everything is delivered much like we are delivering content right now today. And unless those technologies work and they're seamless and they're easy and it's intuitive, then we're gonna get more students who are disengaging. I think also um, when we had a leadership shift, shift and I know um, it, one, of, one of the slides had indicated um, you know, around institutional, you know, clear lines of, of responsibility, right? So I think, you know, our leadership at each of our institutions plays an important role of what those priorities are. Um, our former provost was, was obviously started the conversation around personalizing the educational experience for our students. But when we had a, a shift in our provost in 2018, she came in and was very interested in really looking at the type of student that comes to the University of Pittsburgh and diversifying who our student body um, is and, and, and how we are really supporting our first generation uh, Pell eligible students and and really what are the structures at the university that are either supporting or um, that we need to add 
to ensure that those students are successful on our campus. And, you know, that is also a, a very real and um, driver in our work too, because we, we launched something called the Pitt Success Program to do a Pell Match initiative. So if a student was eligible for a Pell Grant, we would match it dollar for dollar um, from university support. So that increased the number of those students coming to campus. Once they're here, you know, there was, there are a handful of very, very clear and, and well-established mentoring programs for students just to connect um, in their first, second year so that, you know, they have a, a community, if you will, community practice of other like-minded students. But there's not enough for all of the numbers of, of students that came to our campus. So how do we create those structures in real, in real life? And now, given COVID-19, how do we create them in the online virtual space that still is um, supporting those students in the life, you know, where they're at. So wherever they're at in their student journey that we can support them. And, you know, I think we're, we don't have all the answers yet. I think we're still trying to figure it out. I mean, I know some student, uh, some institutions are already announcing we're coming back in the fall, we're doing a hybrid, we're only online, you know, for our campus, we have slated um, at the beginning of June that we'll make it the announcement of, of what we'll do. So we don't, we don't quite know yet. Um, but I think, yes, you're right. A, a lot of our students are very successful and they, and they continue, you know, they come to the University of Pittsburgh. I think they have a, a really wonderful experience and they go out into the world and, you know, we have more than double of the national average of students that go on to graduate school based on our Gallup results. So we have a lot of students that, that um, really get some preparation to do some amazing things, but that's not to say that we're serving all students equally. And I think part of our supports is to ensure that every single student has an amazing experience. Great, thank you. Um, so what I'm hearing is uh, that Pitt is concerned with equity um, and that Pitt is also concerned with not just retaining students, but the other functions of advising that maybe are a little higher up on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay. So you made it through, uh, you made it through to your degree, but now what? Um, can we make sure that you're going to be successful? Um, there's a there's a question in chat that I want to get to in a little bit about other factors uh, that you may or may not have uncovered, Titan folks in your in your research, in terms of institutional success. But I want to first focus on that Maslow hierarchy of needs. I want to pose a hypothesis to the to the panel, which is that coming in the fall, um, we have to start from the assumption that every student is an at-risk student, even students who historically wouldn't be. They they're less certain about what they want. They're less certain about the value that they're going to get from college. They may feel less able. To, to work online with the constraints that they have. And there are more likely to be holes um, in a uh, support network that's been jury rigged than in a system where there's, you know, the fallback is you can go onto campus and find someone and ask. Um, and on the, on the other side, that because of that, and because, because of both the increase in need from the students and the increase in, in um, uh, amount of work that's required because of the holes in the system that wasn't designed to deal with this kind of advising support, um, that all institutions may very well be at risk of needing the kind of collaboration that you're, that you're talking about. Now, let, let me just kind of make that open-ended observation and ask each of you to respond to that, starting with you, Gates. Uh, There's a lot in there, Michael. I'm not sure where, 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 to, where to begin, but you, you, you frame an open-ended hypothesis around starting sort of, if we had a clean slate, if that's what I understood correctly. 
No, it's it's more a question that um, we make a lot of assumptions about for whom this collaboration makes a critical difference, where those gaps in the bars are likely to be from your chart, where the gains yeah. are, mm -hmm. right? So and that and that has to do you you put out two hypotheses for where the gains are. One is that schools with lower retention rates uh, are going to are going to have more gain that they can pick up through coordination. And another was that schools with the lower retention rates are probably understaffed relative to the need. Mm -hmm. um, and so my, my question is, are both of those things now likely to be true about most academic institutions, regardless of how prestigious they are? Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. So, so a, a couple of things. One is um, there was not an enormous amount of variation on demographic and descriptive uh, factors among collaborative institutions and non-collaborative institutions, which we found like fascinating, right? That there's, you know, there's there does not appear to be a size bias or a Pell percentage bias. Um, there's not you know, the, the four-year private institutions are kind of a, a bimodal mix. So setting those aside for a moment, um, there's not an enormous amount of selectivity bias either. So, um, so, so I think what we, what we find is that there are, um, you know, kind of difference makers where the collaboration starts to really pay off. And, um, and so, um, I might offer an example. So, so a lot of institutions have undertaken the work to really disaggregate these results uh, um, or, or to cohort students on the basis of some of the things that you were mentioning and, and Julia was as well, um, Pell status or, or first generation, um, minority students, et cetera. Um, but there have also been efforts to, to disaggregate results on the basis of academic program area. Um, and to craft a um, targeted response uh, to students in particular academic program areas uh, so that uh, th those academic program areas can elevate um, their, their individual re retention rates. Um, everything we, we know about retention uh, is that in the first two years of a four-year degree, is sort of the make or break time for students that would otherwise come in with some risk factors. And it's in that first one or two year period where if students are not, um, have not already selected a major um, or are in the process of navigating switching majors, um, that a lot can happen. And so at the intersection of selecting a major and disaggregating results by academic program area, we find that this collaboration dynamic really starts to um, uh, make a, a, a real difference. There are institutional barriers on occasion that work against thinking about solving this in a cross institutional way, uh, especially if, if those, you know, if students are in the College of Arts and Liberal Sciences, but they want to switch to a major in the business school or in the School of Health Sciences, what might get lost in that, in that process? I know that's something that, Julia, you guys have wrestled with um, as, as, as well. Um, but those are some thoughts about, about how, um, you know, the disaggregation of, of, of student data, uh, can, can inform, um, where and how to make those, those gains, um, from a collaboration perspective. Julia, do you want to just follow up on Gates's comment? I'm sure I have much to add. I think that, you know, right now our campus is, is really s sort of uh, kind of, I think in, in all campuses are thinking about, you know, what are we going to do and how is COVID going to impact the bottom line, which also will have a trickle down effect to some of the ways in which we invest in supports. And so you asked, you know, will, do we have all the people that we need in order to serve the students and, and serve them at the level that we are wanting to? And, and I'm not sure yet, you know, I think like many campuses, we're under a hiring freeze. We're looking at how do we reevaluate our talent and make sure that we have just general operations um, supported. And, and I think at the end of the day, we want to ensure that, you know, students get classes and they're, 
they're involved in in um, just the general operations of the of the institution. So I I don't know that I have much more to add to what Gates was saying because I think that you know right now it's too soon to tell how how COVID nineteen will really impact the student support space. Uh, I think if if we were three months from now or even mid fall, we would have I think a much clearer understanding of of the long term impact because it's going to take a while for us to I think recover and to get back to where we think that we were even even you know in February. I think it's going to take us well over a year to even feel like we're in a groove um, given given what's happening. One of the things we're hearing anecdotally um, is you know that in light of what will surely be, you know, significant reductions in state funding, public institutions are facing, you know, um, you know, pretty dire circumstances um, from a sources of revenue perspective. One of the things, you know, I think that our research highlights is that if you had constrained advisor capacity before, um, and in the pecking order of places you go to cut, um, unfortunately, institutions may be faced with, with reducing student supports resources um, before having to make uh, reductions in uh, instruction. Now, we can, amongst us friends here, debate whether or not those dollars should come out of those student supports categories, but I think the reality is institutions may be forced to go to those categories uh, before they go to areas of instruction for a whole variety of, of incentives, disincentives, unintended consequences in our field today. So the point about advisor capacity is going to become even more extreme, I think we could say in, in, light, of, uh, in light of COVID. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it's extreme either way, whether those dollars go away or they do not, because uh, Michael, to your earlier point, now all students should be considered at risk. So an advisor will need to spend more time with any one given student. And so the caseloads that are already astronomical for many advisors are going to be that much more difficult to manage. And uh, one of the questions in the chat was what other institutional variables did we look at? We looked at multiple, um, you know, whether it was a single question or groups of questions. And, you know, I mentioned technology adoption necessarily in terms of more technology didn't, didn't result necessarily in greater rates of retention or completion where there were certain product categories that made a difference, maybe not the same difference as collaboration in terms of either, you know, the amount of difference um, by a given institution and level of adoption or its statistical significance by type of institution, but certainly a product category like mentoring, which Julia had mentioned, is key because it helps address the issue of advisor capacity because now you have seniors mentoring juniors, so you now you have a, a greater staff of mentors and also helps address this idea too of student disengagement, which was one of the main barriers and that students are more likely oftentimes to engage with, you know, a peer or someone who is more closely walked in their shoes, especially at a time like this. And so if you're looking for solutions in case those dollars are taken away or simply the dollars are not taken away, but your advisors are struggling with even more overcapacity, mentoring and life skills and technologies that help facilitate those relationships because many a times they're done informally and not sort of with a lot of emphasis on a given campus, I think would be the best um, solution in response to COVID. Thank you, Nick. So, so we're at the hour. Um, i just gonna give a couple of takeaways. Um, and first, I wanna remind everyone that this, this video will be archived and available in the eLiterate YouTube channel within about a week. Uh, we will post a, a notification letting folks know that it's available. Um, the few takeaways that really struck me, number one is this idea that every student is at risk now and resources that support those students uh, are going to be strapped at a time when there's going to be pressure to cut them further. Um, and there's a longer conversation to be had perhaps in another session about how we deal with the financial crises uh, realistically without creating a downward spiral by cutting the things that are essential for the institutional survival. Um, and that the technologies that Nick just listed off that seem to have the most impact are, are the ones that aid in the, in the processes you would put in place as you think through where the holes are in that social fabric. 
that holds an institution together. Um, so uh, thinking holistically about creating a social fabric, that is the social fabric, right? We, we, we live our values and that's what, what moves the needle. So I wanna thank our, our uh, presenters today. Uh, thank you, uh, Gates, Nick, and Julia. And thank, uh, thank all of you in the audience, uh, those of you who stuck through, especially to the end. I know you all have busy days right now more than ever. And um, uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks again.